Okay, testing, can y'all hear me? Yes. Hear me well? Okay. Kids aren't with you tonight? They're coming. Okay, good. Good. So, um, made in his image, a look at God in unexpected places. Honestly, I came up with this title because I had to give Holly something to put in the bulletin <laughs> and in the at the corner emails in the newsletter. So I was like, oh, I don't know what to call it. So y'all are going to have to tell me at the end of this evening um, if this sums up what I've shared with you tonight. Y'all have to be the judge of that. So I really enjoy a good story. I especially enjoy, I especially enjoy and love books that are well written and that um, have a lot of good juicy words in them that, that evoke imagery and emotions. And it could be that that's why um, I became an English major when I was an undergrad and then later went on to library science when I pursued my graduate degree because there's books all the time that you're getting to read. Um, but I also really enjoy sharing a good story with others. I really loved the time that the children would come into the media center and I could read picture books to them. And then later when I became a young mother to Chelsea and Alex, I loved our daily reading time, whether it was during the day or at night. That combined with going to the library and checking out as many books as the limit would allow us, we'd bring them all home. Um, those are some of my favorite memories of the kids growing up. My favorite class, as you might imagine then, in grad school was children's literature. And it was there that I was first introduced to Cynthia Ryland. You might be familiar with her, I don't know. If you're not, you're gonna be tonight. <laughs> so I didn't wanna call this Cynthia Ryland. Everybody going, what, what is that all about? But Cynthia Ryland is an award-winning children's and young adult book author who has written over 100 books. But when I was first introduced to her back in 1983 at the beginning of my library school training, she had just had her very first book published in 1982, which was When I Was Young in the Mountains. And you might be familiar with this again if you're not and you love the mountains or you grew up in a mountain area, you might identify, identify with this book. She's a very, oh, and she was only 23 when she wrote this. So when I read a lot of stuff about her life, it's like, really? Don't tell Lisa how quickly she writes books because she like just whips them out. And I don't know, it took me a while just to write up a bunch of stuff for tonight even, and you know. But anyway, um, but she's a very diverse writer. So she's written all kinds of things. She's written picture books that have won Caldecott medals. She's written early readers like um, the um, Henry and Mudge series. Uh, Chelsea and Alex were really big into Nate the Great, so we didn't really do a lot with Henry and Mudge, but anyway, she's got a whole slew of those books. Um, she's written middle grade series books, young adult fiction that again has also won awards, the Newbery Award and the Newbery Honor Award for some of her young adult books. She's written nonfiction uh, biographies. She's written short stories like this one, Every Living Thing. And she's uh, written children's prayer books, and she's written poetry. Um, her writing often focuses on relationships, whether it's with young and old people coming together or people and animals coming together. But she writes about relationships, and she highlights the transforming power of love and also the importance of uh, all living things. In addition, her works are also interspersed with themes of creation, whether it's things that God created or just things that people created, whether they're artists in the books, the different characters of who they are. Sometimes they're people who create something. Um, she says, I write because I have to earn my way. I interpret that as she has to make a living. But she also says, because um, it seems to be what God put me here to do. So without being too preachy, when I, when I read her books, you know, there's always these little hints of God in there, but she's not like overly preachy about it. So you can tell that Cynthia Ryland is a woman of faith. So let's fast forward many years, long after I was a school librarian, long after I was a, a mother of young children, 
Um, and let's press stop on 2010, when I was introduced once again to Cynthia Ryland. One day in April of 2010, I got a package in the mail from a dear friend of mine, and when I opened it up, inside was this book of poetry called God Went to Beauty School, and I was immediately captivated by it. This is a short book of 23 poems, and um, they, it reveals God's discovery of the wonders and the pain in the world that he created. Um, it imagines God experiencing life as a human. And in a 2013 interview with NPR's Arun Rath, Cynthia Ryland said this on writing. I think you have to be a poet to write a good children's book, especially a picture book. And so I've been writing picture books for years and years, and occasionally I've gotten this sudden inspiration, out of the blue, to write a bunch of poems around a theme. And one poem came to me. God Went to Beauty School was the title of that poem. Just came out of the blue. And I sat down and I wrote it. And then after I finished writing it, I got an idea for another God poem. And so I wrote that one. And so it started in the morning, and then by the end of the day, I was finished writing the book. That's what I mean. By the end of the day, she's finished writing the book. So as a former school librarian and just simply a, a, a lover of books, I wanted to share this book with you tonight. Um, but a book about humorous poems about God being read in the sanctuary of a church, is that even kosher? After all, we are made in the image of God. Is poetry about God being human? Images of us, if you will, be degrading to God? Well, thank God that God doesn't see us so lowly that he would be offended to take the form of a human. He's been there, done that. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus, we get a look at God living a human life, but that was 2,000 years ago. What would it look like today? In a lighthearted way, Cynthia Ryland gives us a look in God Went to Beauty School. I was going to read just directly from the book, but I'm not reading all of 23 poems, so don't worry about that. But this book's kind of flimsy, and it's hard to flip the pages and whatever, so I printed everything out so I could just read them to you this way. God Went to Beauty School. And I am going to put my glasses on so I can get every word correctly. God went to beauty school. He went there to learn to give a good perm and ended up just crazy about nails. So he opened up his own shop. Nails by Jim, he called it. He was afraid to call it Nails by God. He was sure people would think he was being disrespectful and using his own name in vain, and then nobody would tip. He got into nails, of course, because he always loved hands. Hands were some of the best things he had ever done. And this way, he could just hold one in his and admire those delicate bones just above the knuckles, delicate as bird's wings. And after he'd done that a while, he could paint all the nails any color he wanted, then say, beautiful, and mean it. God bought a couch. He ordered it from Pottery Barn. And he had a little trouble because his credit card billing address didn't match the delivery address. They weren't totally convinced he was God because for one thing, he got his credit card bills in hell. Just his quirky sense of humor. And he wanted the couch shipped to heaven. The old one was getting too hard. But they didn't buy it until he told them how he had made the first rhinoceros. He had it all down, the DNA, the chromosomes, and especially then, the Holy Spirit. No one is as convincing about the Holy Spirit as God. They asked him, did he want corduroy or leather? He said, what do you think? Oops. Now I'm going to have Lydia Hoyle, <laughs> the little, little Lydia Hoyle jumping uh, microphone off your ear. So Lydia, it's not your ear, it's this microphone. You can be rest assured. Maybe it's when you put glasses on. I think that's probably the problem. God made spaghetti. 
And he didn't have a ceiling, so he tried it to make it stick onto Jupiter. But that just vaporized the noodles. So God decided, have faith, it was cooked al dente. He filled up a big bowl and got himself a piece of sourdough and a copy of the New Yorker, and God had supper. And he would actually have liked somebody to talk to. He didn't like eating alone. But most people think God lives on air. Apparently, they've not noticed all the food he's created. So nobody ever invites him over, unless it's communion, and that's always such a letdown. <laughs> God's gotten used to one plate at the table. He lights a candle anyway. God went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you don't need me, you're God. And God said, well, you're pretty good at playing me. I figured you know what the problem was. So the doctor examined him. He couldn't find anything wrong except a little skip in God's heart. Probably nothing, he told God, but eat more fish. God sighed. He was hoping for more than that, maybe an antibiotic or a shot. He knew about that skip in his heart. He knew it was nothing fish could cure. The skip had started way back when he had first heard that some people didn't believe in him. It scared him. It still does. God got arrested. But they didn't know it was him because he had on his disguise. It was his guy disguise. He was actually pretty proud of it. It had a tattoo around the belly button, which hurt. Anyway, he got arrested because he got into a fight in a bar when somebody said something about Jesus Christ, except not in a good way at all. Might as well have insulted God's mother. Now that's a whole other story. Because God, who was only there because he liked the jukebox, lost it. And his anger erupted like the wrath of... Oh, right, never mind. Just be careful dropping names in Kenny's tavern. Might be next to a relative. <laughs> God wrote a book. No, not that one. Everybody thinks he wrote that one, but he didn't. He's a better writer than that. Those guys just went on and on. And did they bother to edit? No. But wouldn't you know, you mention a name and you're in. So they said, I didn't write it, God wrote it. A sure way to get out of revising. But God wrote his own book. He wrote it for one little boy, just one. He read it to the boy at bedtime because the boy couldn't sleep. So God read him a book. The boy grew up, he became a writer. Which one? Not telling. God got cable, although nowadays we probably say God's got streaming, <laughs> streaming service. This book was written in 2003, so God got cable. And for a week watched nothing but, didn't see the comet, didn't see the hurricane, missed that baby being born entirely, just watched cable. Funny thing is, he liked it. He knew he wasn't supposed to all those girls crying about their boyfriends, all those track meets, all that soup and, I mean, soap and toothpaste. He liked it, couldn't help it. Then Gabriel came over with a deck of cards and the next thing you know, they have played poker four weeks straight. Gabriel's beard nearly as long as God's and corn chips all over the place. And what God, what God decided was that he liked not cable, not poker, but a break. Every now and then, even God needs a break. God found God. It was the weirdest thing. God got all religious on himself. He was looking for something to do, so he went into this church in Boston, one of those churches from the 1800s that likes to consider itself old. This always gives God a good laugh. And he was all beside himself. And he, I'm sorry, and he was all by himself. And it was quiet, like you wouldn't believe. 
And up to the sky went these beautiful rafters. And all around him were these beautiful stained glass windows. And everybody was praying. All the people in the pictures, all the statues, all the angels in the room were praying. God knew better than to look at any of the crosses. He was still trying to figure that one out. But he knew that he had actually found a holy place. So he dropped a coin in the building fund box before he went away. God got a desk job just to see what it would be like. I made his back hurt. God always had a bad back anyway, the weight of the world and all that. He thought his job was tough till he sat at a desk all day. It was torture. He could feel the light inside him growing dimmer and dimmer. And he thought if he had to pick up that phone one more time, he'd just start the whole Armageddon thing people keep talking about. Not his idea, not his plan, but in a pinch, he's sure he could come up with something. The only thing that got him through to the end of the day was Snickers bars. He ate 37. <laughs> Plus, thinking about the Eagle Nebula in the constellation Serpents, that helped. God died. Sort of. It's a long story, but if you have time. Okay. God has been God for so long, even he doesn't have a clue where he came from. For a while, he wasn't sure he was God until everything he said or thought or wanted to happen, happened. That was the big tip-off. So he didn't remember where he came from or why. He just knew what he could do. Oh, he wanted to be very careful with this. This could be good. This could be the biggest thing in the universe. He just had to be a really tip-top God, somebody who made no mistakes, who didn't show up late for work, who competed only against himself. He could do this. He was God. So he thought about everything for a really, 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 long time. Then he opened his mouth and said, let there be light, and it was so. Good, said God, and after that, no one could stop him. He said, let there be a billion, trillion, zillion times, and when he was finished, there were so many new things, even he didn't know what some of them were, like grapefruit spoons. But it was all good, really good, said God. Then who knows what went wrong, but one morning, God woke up, and his right-hand angel at the time, Sheila, said, you know those two brothers? One just killed the other. God could not believe this. He could not believe this. God, in fact, did not even know exactly what killed meant until Sheila explained it very carefully to him. And there he saw that boy, Abel was his name, covered with blood and not a hint of life in him, not a whip. God wanted to start all over again, make everything all over again from scratch, make it so nothing in this world could be killed. But Sheila said, you can't start over. You'd have to kill everything to start over. God hadn't considered this. God lived purely in the moment, so he wasn't the greatest long-range planner. But he stopped and he thought about what Sheila said. And though there were some things he could probably kill and feel pretty okay about, he wasn't all that attached to the chickenpox virus, insert coronavirus here, for example, there were other things he could not ever let go. Sea turtles, for one. Spiders, for another. Too beautiful. Too beautiful, he said. What to do? God was like anybody else. Everything was the first time for him, too. He didn't mean to make what happened between Abel and his brother happen. He thought they'd be good buddies, like ducks. Hadn't they learned anything from ducks? Apparently not. 
God was stricken. He did not know what to do. If he left things as they were, there was bound to be more killing. Could he bear this? God's blood was love. God's bones were love. God's eyes, his heart, his kidneys were love. He didn't know what he'd done wrong that caused a thing, the other brother, to be born without love, a thing that came from him. He asked Sheila what she thought he should do now that killing was a part of things. And Sheila said, die, just like that. Sheila had always been a very smart girl. So the story goes that God took on the blood, the bones, the eyes, the heart, the kidneys of a man. And he made real friends. And he loved a real family. And he prayed real prayers. He didn't go unnoticed. Ever after, religions were made that insisted that God had been this guy or that guy or the other. But one thing happened for sure. God died. No one knows precisely how, but sure enough, he did it. Because it was the only way he could find out what it is to love a drink of water, sleep, a warm coat, a mother, a father, morning, evening, a really good joke, and pain. God saw so much pain and he was so sorry for it. He didn't know it would happen quite that way, but he finally saw how pain caused one of two things, a reverence for life or killing. Both grew from the same seed, the one he had planted. So God went back to being God, finally comfortable with being called all-knowing, because now he actually was. And after that, he made sure he ate popcorn and watched movie, a movie every Friday night, petted the cats, fed the birds, and played the jukebox at Kenny's Tavern. God needed to remember what a cool thing it was to be a guy or a girl, an eagle, a pig, to be life. God went to beauty school. He went there to learn how to give a good perm. But what he was really there for was the hands. Let's pray together. Dear good and gracious God, the Bible tells us that we are created in your image. We are a representation of you. We are here on earth to represent your love, kindness, mercy, and grace. All that is good in you, Lord, we pray that we show it to every person we come into contact with. Help us, Lord, to be truly an image of you. We are grateful, God, for the life of Jesus and how he demonstrated exactly what that looks like. We thank you for creative writers like Cynthia Ryland, who share with us different ways to ponder about you. Although all in fun, there is a bit of a whisper there of, well, what if? Or maybe in some cases, nope, that's not how I see God. In any case, thank you for this time that we as fellow believers can explore together a fresh way to wonder about who you are. We make this prayer in the name of the one who knows what it is like to be God and what it is like to be human, Jesus. In his name, amen. Thank you all. Thank you for coming, and thank you for those watching on YouTube. Um, I hope thinking about God as human in a humorous way uh, in these poems that I've shared tonight is a pleasant reminder to us that... Um, it's comforting to know that God knows what the human experience is like because he experienced it. So it was kind of fun. I hope you enjoyed that. And I um, hope it gets you through each day knowing that. But if it's not, on your way out, there are Snickers in the basket. Please take one, not 37. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Oh, I don't know that one. She's only written over 100 books, so no, I don't know that one. Is that a young adult? No, it's a children. It's a children. Is it a picture?